In January of 1998, a small think tank called the Project for a New American Century, an adjunct of the American Enterprise Institute, had its offices in the same building as the American Enterprise Institute sent a letter to Bill Clinton. <coughs> I want you to get the date, January of 1998, three years before George W. Bush became president. <coughs> In that letter, the signers urged a, quote, regime change in Iraq. In other words, we should go to war and knock off Saddam Hussein. Let me tell you, some of the signers of that letter. Dick Cheney, Donald Rumsfeld, Paul Wolfowitz, Richard Pearl, Scooter Libby, John R. Bolton, Elliot Abrams, all of whom were appointed to top national security positions three years later when George W. Bush became president. In effect, the Project for a New American Century wrote the script for the Iraq War. And in fact, you can compare a statement of principles that the Project for American Century put out when it was formed <coughs> with a speech that George W. Bush gave in June of 2002. And you will, this was the this was a speech at West Point, where Bush first declared defense of the principle of preventive war. You can compare the statement of the of principles of the Project for American, for a New American Century to George W. Bush's speech. They wrote that too. <clears throat> now, when the television networks, <clears throat> CNN, Fox, even the big networks want experts to argue questions of war or peace. They call on, often call on think tanks for their experts. And these think tanks are essentially underwritten by corporate America. <coughs> but the viewer is never told exactly who pays the salary of these big thinkers. Now, that's an illustration of the academic part of the complex I'm talking about. Talk about the military. <clears throat> One of the things that stunned me when I started to work in Washington and started covering foreign affairs was the discovery that the State Department does not run foreign policy. The Pentagon. The State Department has not run American foreign policy since George Marshall and John Foster Dulles. If you want the history of the Vietnam War, for example, you do not read the foggy bottom papers. You read the Pentagon papers. Robert McNamara, the Secretary of Defense, was the architect of the Vietnam War. Dean Rusk was Secretary of State. What was his role? His role essentially was the role of a puppet to try to defend at congressional hearings policies that were created in the Pentagon. But you don't have to go back to the Vietnam War to illustrate the principle that the Pentagon runs foreign policy. Just look at the Iraq War. Was it Colin Powell's war? Colin Powell was Secretary of State. It was Donald Rumsfeld's war. The Pentagon has been running foreign policy in this country for more than 40 years. <clears throat> it was Powell as Secretary of State, as quoted by Bob Woodward in a, in a book called The Commanders, who tried to prevent the war in Iraq by telling President Bush that the rule of the China shop would 
prevail in war. If you break it, you own it. We broke a rock and we own it. Powell was not one of the signers of the letter to President Clinton in 1998. Rumsfeld was. Of course, what this is really all about is money. The Pentagon has the money. And in Washington, as elsewhere, money talks. It is a simple fact that there are more soldiers in uniform playing in military bands than there are foreign service officers in the State Department. There are about 6,000 foreign service officers and there are about 7,000 military musicians. <clears throat> military industrial congressional academic complex. The nexus of this really is the industrial congressional nexus. <clears throat> a symbiotic relationship that's developed between the giant defense contractors and members of Congress. And this is really the heart of the problem. The big defense contractors are Lockheed Martin, which has last year 30 billion in contracts, Northrop Grumman, 23 billion, Boeing, 23, BAE Systems, which is actually a British corporation but has offices in Tampa, 16 billion, General Dynamics, 14 billion, Raytheon, 14 billion, United Technologies, 8 billion. In 2009, the purchases of the top 100 defense contractors came to 377 and a half billion dollars. And then those are government figures. Now here's the way it works. The companies working, the companies, the defense industries work with the Pentagon and the various services to develop weapons systems. And then they set up a subcontracting program to spread the goodies to as many states as possible. When I first started writing about that, the B-1 bomber was a big deal. And I discovered that Boeing, which had the major contract, had managed to distribute contracts in 48 of the 50 states. So every senator and many congressmen care very deeply about defense spending. Because if they vote against anything, where there are jobs in their state or district, if they fail to support a weapons system, they'll be attacked in the next election. They'll be called soft on defense. And I can guarantee you that this is a powerful incentive, because studies have shown that many of the most liberal senators, the late Ted Kennedy, Chris Dodd consistently vote for jobs, consistently vote for weapons, many often, often weapons the Pentagon had not requested. I, I want to just take one example. Now you know, you know that the President